4.04. I think I heard just 4.04. Sing a couple of verses of 404. You're singing really well, so keep up the good singing. Sing the first two verses to begin with. 404, verse 1 and verse 2, please. Hymn number 206, 206, page number uh, 259, and let's keep that good singing up. I thank Mr. Bell for leading the singing thus far, but 206, so oh, sweet is the story of Jesus, the wonderful Savior of men, who suffered and died for the sinner. I'll tell it again and again. 206, standing as we sing. Let's stand together. Amen. 
Now let's still our hearts in the Master's presence together, please. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, as we come before the throne of heavenly grace together. Eternal God <clears throat> and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee that Thou art sovereign. We thank Thee and praise Thee that Thou art the God that inhabiteth eternity. We thank Thee that Thou art Jehovah, and there is none else like unto Thee. We praise Thee that as we come and sing and pray and read the Scriptures and preach concerning all that Thou hast revealed to us, that we are not worshipping a dead God or a false God or a God made and fashioned of man's imagination and with men's hands of wood, of, uh, of stone or of gold or silver or anything of the like. But we praise Thee that we come unto the living and true God and there is none else beside Thee. And, O God, we thank Thee for Thy mercy and Thy grace which has been evident toward us in the fact that Christ came. We thank Thee for those tremendous gospel words in John 3 and the verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How we rejoice in redemption. How we rejoice that Christ came. How we rejoice that he wasn't sent against his own will, but he voluntarily came as a vicarious sacrifice, as a substitute to, to bear away our sin. And we rejoice in his perfect life. We rejoice in his atoning death. We, we thank thee for the precious blood that was shed. We know there is no remission without the shedding of blood. How we praise thee, the blood was shed. Not just any blood, but the blood of the God-man, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, blood that is powerful to, to save, blood that can cleanse us from every stain and make us as white as snow. And how we rejoice in the precious blood of the Lamb. How we thank thee for Jesus Christ. And, O oh, Father, we come before thee, and we thank Thee for God the Holy Spirit as well. We thank Thee for the one that came and opened our blinded eyes and removed our hard hearts of stone and replaced our hard hearts with a, a heart of flesh that would be receptive to the gospel. We thank Thee that the Father planned redemption and the, the, the Son procured redemption, but we rejoice that the Holy Spirit applies that redemption to the soul. The only reason anyone is saved in this meeting tonight is for the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts and our lives and we cry out before Thee, we are not worthy of such a work, but we thank Thee for it. And, O oh God, we pray tonight, if there be one in our gathering yet unsaved, yet without Christ, Yet in their sin, O oh God, we pray that Thou would send Thy Holy Spirit to open their blinded eyes so that even though they came into this meeting in their sin, they can leave this meeting in that sense with a spiritual skip in their step, singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now... I see, O oh God, we pray that many in money slain tonight in the building, listening on the loudspeakers out in the village on such a beautiful day as that, listening online later on, that many in this village and countryside would become the slain of the Lord tonight and that redemption would visit this house as God comes down and visits this vine. And we know, we know we have been blessed indeed. O oh God, we do pray, remember, each one in our church family that can't be with us tonight. We pray bless them, encourage them. We just pray for those especially that are sick and those that are shut in. We pray that thou just encourage their hearts and presence thyself with them. We pray for those that aren't here and they could be here and they should be here. We pray warm their hearts concerning the uh, forsaking of the assembly of the saints. And Lord, we do pray that thou be pleased to Touch those that have been through bereavement of late and, and are feeling very, uh, very heavy in the heart because of all of the sorrow that seems to have abounded. And 
Lord, thou knowest each individual and each family that has been affected of late, and we just pray, comfort them. Wrap thy loving arms about them. Give them that peace that passeth all understanding, and minister unto the soul even tonight. But, O oh God, as we pray, we ask that thy that the worship of thy holy name may have that seal of approval tonight as God comes down and we have the joy and the privilege of doing business with God. Do business with us. And we pray that everything that is said and done may be said and done to thine honor and to thy glory alone. For we ask all these things in and through the altogether lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his eternal glory. Amen. We're singing again hymn number 208. Hymn number 208. Sound the gospel of grace abroad. There's life in the risen Lord. Spread the news of the gift of God. There's life in the risen Lord. God above desires it. Sinful man requires it. Tell it around. Let it abound. There's life in the risen Lord. 208 will stand after the introduction. Let's stand together. Sound the gospel of grace abroad, there's life in the risen Lord. Fed the news of the gift of God, there's life in the risen Lord. God of desires it, sinful man requires it. Tell it around, tell it about. life in the risen Lord. Glory be to Jesus, who from bondage frees us. I trust that each one in this meeting tonight has been freed and liberated from the bondage of sin, for only Christ can do that task. And it's our prayer that you would repent, believe the gospel, and be in time. Now, turning in the Scriptures of Truth together to John's Gospel, John's Gospel, chapter 8. John's Gospel, chapter 8, we're going to begin our reading at the verse 31. We're going to read through to the end of the verse 47. If you're using a church Bible in the pew in front of you, you'll find the reading on page 
1075. 1075. In a moment, we're going to be taking the verse 36 as our text and looking at the title, Freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom in Jesus Christ. But at this stage, John chapter 8, beginning our reading at the verse 31. <clears throat> verse 31, the Word of God states, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. That word servant is the Greek word doulos, the slave of sin, the slave of sin. Verse 35, And the servant or the slave abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with the Father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil." and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God Heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his holy, precious, and infallible word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. Now at this stage in the service, we welcome each one to the house of the Lord tonight. It's good to see you. And we welcome those visiting with us as well. And we trust the Lord will bless each one as we gather for worship, even in Monash Lane this evening. Just after the gospel service tonight, if I could ask the Youth Fellowship to remain behind, we'll just have a short practice for next week. That would be greatly appreciated, young people. Then for the week ahead of us on Tuesday, the gospel bus meeting for the boys and girls at the usual time of 7 p.m. Please do uh, remind boys and girls and grandchildren and children and whoever else, neighbors, children, that that the meetings are on and they will be very welcome. That's Tuesday, 7 p.m. for the boys and girls. And on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. I'll take the form of a deputation meeting uh, with the Macaulay family going to Uganda. So please come support that meeting with your presence and also be prepared to give as we uh, try to encourage and support a missionary going out from our own denomination to the land of Uganda. Then on Thursday, there's a Sabbath school practice for Children's Day at 7.30. So I trust all the parents, young people involved with the Sabbath school will take note of that Thursday at 7.30. Then on Saturday, if anyone is available, volunteers are needed, we're going to endeavor to paint the fence around the church car park, and we're meeting here at 10 a.m. If you can join with us, that would be greatly appreciated. And there's no youth fellowship now until the September time, and we had a tremendous time of blessing in the last year with the young people. You know, we have a, a wonderful bunch of young people in Monash Lane, and we're very thankful for that. 
And I trust even the older ones that you'll pray for the young people. Remember them before the Lord, that they'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Savior and become more and more and more like their master day after day. But the service is next Lord's Day, Sabbath school and Bible class at 1045. Then next Lord's Day is Children's Day, so uh, primarily focusing on the Sabbath school in the morning and more of a youth service for the youth fellowship in the evening. But the morning service at 12 noon, the evening gospel service at 7 p.m. Our speaker will be our brother, Mr. Andrew Irwin, and both the 12, 12 noon service and the 7 p.m. service will be preceded by a time of prayer at 11.30 and 6.30, respectively. Today, as you leave, is our retiring missionary offering, and let me thank you for the maintenance fund offering that came to £380 last week. Also, if I could ask for prayer for Wednesday morning, as I'll be in the Bronte Primary School, we look forward to that, and always a tremendous opportunity in the gospel. Please remember it. And then please remember some dates for the diary. Friday the 14th of June at 8 p.m., it's coming up very quickly now, is our baptismal service in our Bambridge Church. Church please do come and support those that are going through the waters of baptism. And then our week of meetings, the 23rd through to the 28th of June, with our guest speaker, the Reverend David McMillan, speaking on the end times. Also, as you leave today, there's updates on the work of God in fame and to do with fame. And then let me once again encourage, as a church family, each one to pray for the Bowles family circle after the death of Irene's uh, sister on Friday. Please remember Peter and Stephen as well, and each one associated with that family circle, that the Lord would comfort them, the Lord would bless them, and the Lord would touch and encourage the heart of each one that has been bereaved of late. But please do to continue to pray for those that are sick. There are many that are laid aside in sickness at the moment, those shut in, and those that have been bereaved, already mentioned, and others that are feeling very keenly that loss in these days. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we'll have our offering hymn now, please. Hymn number 265. Hymn number 265, a well-known hymn, so I trust you'll sing it out well. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. We'll keep our seats for the first part of this hymn, while our tithes and offerings are collected for the work of God in this place. 265.
we sing, let me, uh, Sandra sing, let me ask, who's singing their very best? Oh dear, I don't see a single hand tonight. I see one, I see one thumbs up. That's no good. You see, when we're singing that chorus, we're singing of our blessed Savior. And it's true. How marvelous, how wonderful. You know, as British people, we don't usually use big adjectives to describe things. We're usually very moderate. But how we can use these words to express our desire and love for Christ. How marvelous, how wonderful. So let's really sing that chorus out and sing it to the glory of God. Verses 4 and 5 will stand after the note. Tremendous singing. I fear I might have lost my voice singing. <laughs> well, the Lord will give us help. John chapter 8, John chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 36 is our text. Looking at the title, Freedom, Freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom in Jesus Christ. John 8 and the verse 36 reads, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Freedom in Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Let's ask for the Lord's help. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we ask for thy help now. We ask for physical help. Lord, give us uh, strength to preach tonight. Give us the voice to preach tonight. And Lord, I ask that thou give us all spiritual help. Lord, we all need a word from thyself. And we pray that thou be pleased to apply thy word to our hearts and allow us not just to have open ears, but open hearts unto thy truth. We ask that thou touch the hearts of the converted. Bless them as they consider the gospel afresh. Remember those that are in a backslidden condition. Lord, thou knowest each heart. Lord, thou knowest those that are cold tonight, spiritually. Lord, draw them back into the fold. We pray for those that are still unsaved. Oh, God, we pray for them. We plead for them tonight. Save their never-dying souls. Oh, it would be such a joy, such a joy to have the opportunity to lead a soul to Christ tonight. doesn't matter if it's young or old, but, Lord, we long to see a soul saved. Do it for thy glory, we plead. But answer our cry and give us help. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake alone. Amen. At the Gospel Boss meeting last Tuesday evening, John chapter 8 and the verse 36 was the memory verse for the boys and girls to memorize. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And as they were repeating this verse over and over and over again, I must confess it touched my heart afresh. It's a word that touched my heart afresh as I thought, what a tremendous summary of the gospel. John 8 and the verse 36 really is. The gospel, liberty, freedom, essentially all of it summed up in Jesus Christ. 
and Jesus Christ alone. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. How many, how many Christians with good intentions, when doing personal evangelism, at times often get the gospel so wrong? I know I've experienced this myself as a young Christian, a very young Christian, and going door knocking with an older Christian. And I remember knocking a particular door, and this man, I must confess, a good man in many ways, but he got bogged down in so much stuff. And he talked about politics and talked about government and talked about this thing and that thing and the other thing, and you could stand there for an hour and there was no gospel coming out of him. He might have had a conversation for an hour or so, but just full of hobby horses and very little uh, speaking of Christ. Well, friend, I want to tell you the message we are to declare in our personal evangelism, the message we are going to declare tonight, and whoever you're speaking to, whether I'm speaking to a crowd that often frequents the house of God, or whether I speak to a Roman Catholic or a Russellite or a Mormon or a Jew or an atheist or whoever it is you're talking to, there is one thing they need to hear, and it is the message of freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom in Jesus Christ. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, if you spend the time later on tonight and read through the entirety of John chapter 8, you'll find that John chapter 8 is a chapter where the Jews are trying to trip up the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to try and trap him in his words, ensnare him in his words. And there's a simple reason for that, because the religious leaders hated the Lord. They hated the Lord with a passion. And the Lord, being the perfect preacher and the example to all preachers, did what every faithful preacher ought to do. He told them what they needed to hear. He told them what they needed to hear, even though it may have been a hard message. He told them what they needed to hear. And he told them they were sinners. Look at the verse 44. He told them they were sinners. In fact, told them more than they were sinners. Told them that they were of their father, the devil. It says in the verse 44, year of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Now that's hard hitting preaching. That's hard hitting preaching. None of this soft, soppy, wet sort of preaching we have nowadays from many a pulpit. This is hard hitting preaching that they are sinners, they are the children of the devil, and they are in bondage of sin. That's what the Lord tells them. In the verses 40, 45, and 47, look at the verse 40. We find the Lord explains their hardness. Very interesting, isn't it? Look at the verse 40. It says, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have learned of God. This did not Abraham. Look at the verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Then look at the verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I don't know about you, but do you ever find in personal evangelism, when you're trying to tell a family member, a colleague, or or somebody, just a stranger on the street about Christ, and they have no appetite for the gospel whatsoever, you ever ask the question, why? I tell you why. Because in order to be saved, the Holy Spirit has to first open the blinded eyes. The Holy Spirit must do a work within the soul to make them receptive to the gospel. And the verse 47 explains why hearts are so hard to the gospel. It says, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. But what's the answer to all of this? What's the answer? to the hard heart? What's the answer to people being of their father, the devil? What's the answer to people being in the bondage of sin? What is the answer? Verse 36 is the answer. Verse 36, our text. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free 
indeed. There's four points I want to leave with you tonight. I'll outline them now. You can listen out for them later. Number one, the bondage of sin. Number two, the person of the Son. Thirdly, the liberty in the Savior. And number four, the assurance of salvation. So then number one, the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin. Look at the verse 36 with me again. It says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You know, it's very interesting. We find that here in our Bibles, chapter 8 and verse 36, Christ highlights the problem that when individuals are in their sin, they're in bondage. They're in the bondage of sin. They're in the shackles of sin. They're in the chains of sin. Sin is a very real problem. And all men and women, boys and girls in this meeting and around the world tonight are all in the shackles of sin if they find themselves without the Savior. Look at the verse 24, if you would, please. The Lord explains it further. <clears throat> verse 24, it says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You see, there's an interesting wee thing I want to point out here about the verse 24. You see the word he, that's in italics. That means the translators added it in. It's a very honest way of translating. We're thankful for that. Uh, but I want you to read that without the he in the verse, because it gives a further meaning. It says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am. You see the title now? You see the title for God? You see the title for Jehovah? Ye shall die in your sins. And the Lord emphasizes in the verse 24 that you must believe that Jesus Christ is God, otherwise you will die in your sin. It's no good saying you're a Christian and say you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the great I am. You must believe that, otherwise you will die in your sin. And Christ's rejection, anything that is Christ's rejection, will lead you to hell. Anything sinful will lead you to hell. Anything rebellious against God's law will lead you to hell. You see, all of us, come with me to Romans 5 and the verse 12. All of us have this sin problem. All of us have this sin problem. And in this gospel service, it's good to be reminded of that fact. It keeps us humble before the Lord, even the child of God. All of us have this sin problem and all of us are born in a totally depraved condition. And we're born in that way because of the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Our first father, our federal head, Adam, failed. He sinned and, and sin came into the world. And as a consequence of that, all by ordinary generation or everyone that was born in an ordinary fashion are the children of Adam. Eventually down the all the great, great, greats of grandchildren, all of us are the children of Adam and all of us are affected with the plague of sin. And it says in Romans 5 and the verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Look at it now, the end of this verse. For that all have sinned. You see, all of us have this sin problem. All of us have this, this bondage. We're essentially, in that sense, born into bondage, in this sin bondage. Look at Romans chapter 3. It highlights further how, how bad our sin is and the terrible, pitiful state we are in, in the bondage of sin. It says in Romans 3 in the verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all, you listen to these words, all, everyone. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And the word of God tells us in the verse 19 of Romans 3 that if you die in your sin, if you die in the shackles and the bondage of your sin, then you'll stand before the great white throne of judgment and you'll have nothing to say of value because you know you're guilty. Look at the verse 19. 
Now we know that what things, whoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, look at it now, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, you can try and argue all you like, all you like, my sin isn't that bad. Listen, your sin is worse than you can even imagine. You can ever imagine. Your sin is terrifying. Your sin leaves you in shackles and bondage. And eventually, if you die in your sin, will lead to judgment and will lead to hell. And you say, where in the Bible does it describe my sin as bondage? Well, come back with me to John chapter 8. Look at John chapter 8 and look at the verse 34. Verse 34 tells us, and this is why I highlighted the verse. It says in the verse 34, it says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin, well, one second, everyone looking this way, that's all of us. All of us are guilty. All of us have committed sin. All of us have transgressed God's law. But keep reading. Look at the verse 34 again. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. That word servant is the word doulos, is the slave of sin. Now, slaves are in bondage. Slaves are in shackles. Slaves are those that are in chains. Slaves are those that are not free, are not liberated, have no, no choice in the matter. They must do as their master demands. If you are one that committed sin, which you are for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then the scripture says, if you are still in your sin, you are the slave of sin. Slave of sin. We find it many a time, this language of the bondage of sin. Look at Romans with me. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and look at the verse 21. I want you all to turn in your Bibles to these places. Romans chapter 8 and the verse 21. We find again this idea that if you're in your sin, you're in bondage. You're in shackles. You're in slavery. And it says in Romans chapter 8 and the verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered. Listen to it now, delivered. The idea of being rescued the idea of salvation shall be delivered, look at it, from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now the word of God tells you if you're not yet in the liberty of being a child of God, the liberty and the freedom in Jesus Christ, then you're in the bondage of corruption. What's that? The bondage of your sin. A slave of sin. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and the verse 1. Galatians 5 and the verse 1 is one of those very well-known verses, and it's a verse for the child of God primarily, yet it illustrates the point that sin is likened unto slavery, unto bondage, unto a prison house, unto shackles. There is no freedom in sin. And it says in Galatians 5 verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty, you see this, the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. And look how it, it, it likens our sin. Verse 1 of chapter 5 of Galatians, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Time and time again in your Bible, you read that your sin keeps you in bondage, keeps you in slavery. That is not a healthy position to be in, friend. You know, sin, it deserves the wrath of God. It deserves hell forevermore. We won't mince our words tonight. We must be plain with your soul. Uh, sin deserves hell. Sin deserves the wrath of God. And Revelation 20 in the verse 15 tells you, this is a warning to every single soul in this meeting. Whoever you are, however young or however old you may be, if you're still in your sin, you're still in bondage, and your bondage of sin will lead you to hell if you don't repent. It says in Revelation 20 verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Was cast into the lake of fire. That's the bondage of sin. And we see it in our text in John 8 and the verse 36. All this talk of freedom in Christ, it reminds us of the bondage of those that are not in Christ, the bondage of sin. But then secondly, I want you to note the person of the Son. The person of the Son. Look at the verse 36 of John 8. It says, now look at it, if the Son, 
If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, if we're ever going to understand this freedom that the Lord is speaking about in the verse 36, we need to understand who the character is that he's talking about at the start of the verse 36 is, don't we? If the Son, who's he talking about? He's talking about himself, talking about the Son of God, talking about the second person of the Trinity. That's who the Son is in the verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You see, you and I are sinners. You and I in our sin are heading on the broad road to a lost eternity of hellfire forevermore. But somebody, there is an individual that can set us free. And who is that? If the Son, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Well, who is this? Who is the Son? Come with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, just back a few pages from our text. John chapter 1 is one of those chapters that highlights beautifully for us who the Son is, who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God. Jesus Christ, in case you're in any doubt whatsoever, I meant to make it clear, I want to underline it tonight. Jesus Christ was not just a good man, was not just the best of men. Jesus Christ was not just uh, not, not an angel or anything of that, that, that ilk that other cults and the like would, would tell you. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is divine. He is God. He is the second person in the Trinity, Jehovah. And it says in the verse 1 of John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Look at it now. And the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word, and Jesus Christ is God. And it says in the verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the verse 16. And it highlights this truth that Jesus Christ, the Son that is denoted in our text, he is God and he is man. He is the God man. And 1 Timothy 3 and the verse 16 brings all together that John 1 verse 1 and verse 14 is saying, it says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, and without controversy, This is not up for debate. It's just a matter to be believed. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Look at it now. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. You see, this is who the Son is. This is who the Son of John 8 and the verse 36 is. It is Jesus Christ. It is the second person of the Trinity. It is the the Son of the Father. It is the creator of all things. It is God manifest in the flesh. It is the one that came and we find in the Scriptures that he uh, was two natures in one person and in that state forever now, he is the God-man. That's Jesus Christ. And that's why the words of the verse 24, again, of John 8 are so vital. You must understand, you must believe who Jesus Christ is if you're ever going to be saved, if you're ever going to be free. And the Lord said in the verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Ye shall die in your sins. Uh, For if ye believe not that I am, Ye shall die in your sins. You must believe that Jesus Christ is God. And as God, the God-man, he came with a mission. He came with a goal in view when he was born in his incarnation. We read in Matthew 1 and the verse 21 what his name means. And it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And you know it well, don't you? And what does it say after that? For he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. That's what we're reading in John 8 and the verse 36. We're reading, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What what are we reading? We're reading, If the Son, Jesus Christ, 
shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Why? Because he came for this purpose, to save his people from their sins, to save us from bondage, to save us from hell. But then I want you to note not only the bondage of sin and the person of the Son, but thirdly, the liberty in the Savior. The liberty in the Savior. And look what we find in our verse now. If the Son therefore shall make you free. Isn't that tremendous? When you consider our sin, when you consider our many iniquities, when you examine for a moment, if you're honest, the law of God, you realize, if you're honest, as you read through the Ten Commandments, that you are guilty, 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 right the way through the law of God, guilty as charged. You realize you're a sinner. You realize Romans 3 and the verse 23 is perfectly accurate when it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know if you're honest, you're in these shackles, this bondage of, of sin, and you can't free yourself. You can't liberate yourself. You can't deliver yourself from your sin. And if you continue in your sin, you will go to hell forevermore and face eternity eternal wrath, the wrath of God. Well, friend, I want to tell you tonight, there is liberty in the Savior. There is freedom in Jesus Christ. It says, if the Son, and now you know who He is. He is God. He is man. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is able. He is powerful. He is able to save. And it says, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, Ye shall be free indeed. Oh, friend, there's liberty in Christ. Maybe you say, well, how can Jesus Christ set me free? How can Jesus Christ set me free? Well, I'll put it in simple terms, as simple as I can. No sin is allowed in heaven. God must, as a just God, punish sin. Sin has to be dealt with. It cannot be ignored, cannot be brushed under the carpet. Sin must be dealt with, and God will deal with that. That's what the judgment day is all about. God, as a just God, will deal with sin. So you and I, as sinners, we need somebody to deal with our sin, do we not? You and I need somebody because we're sinners. We're full of sin. We're continually, day and daily, breaking God's law. We, on our own, we're heading closer and closer to a lost eternity in hell. And we need someone to do something for us. We need a substitute. We need someone to liberate us. That's what we need. We need liberty in the Savior. So what has Jesus Christ done? Well, He came and He lived a perfectly righteous life. That's vital. Vital we understand that. You know, many focus just on the cross. And to preach the cross is a, a wonderful thing. That's what we are to do. Preach Christ and Him crucified. But don't miss the fact that the only reason Christ qualified to die a substitutionary death on the cross was because He lived a sinless life. Because He is righteous. Come with me to Hebrews 4. I want you all to turn there. Hebrews 4 and look at the verse 15. Hebrews 4 and the verse 15 tells us that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. You and I are in the bondage of sin. We needed somebody outside of that, outside of sin, outside of that bondage that could come and do all that was needed and liberate us. Well, that's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews 4 and the verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens. Look at it. Jesus, the Son of God. Now, isn't it int interesting in the verse 14 that we read the title that he's given of himself in, in John 8 and verse 36. The Son. The Son. That's key to remember. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Look at the verse 15. For if we have not an high priest... Uh, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched to the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. So we find here the Lord is tempted just like you've been tempted. I'd argue the Lord is tempted far, far, far worse than you will ever be tempted as well. And look at the end of the verse 15. Yet without sin. Yet without sin. 
He lived a righteous life. That's why he qualifies to be our substitute. That's why John the Baptist could cry out, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Why? Because his righteous life qualifies him to be the substitute that you and I need. Qualifies him to be the Redeemer, the Savior. And then look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And then we read that he performed that task that he came to do. We read in that, that first chapter of Matthew, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And we read in Romans 5 that yes, he did what he came to do. He completed what he came to perform. And it says in Romans 5 and the verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ, look at it, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at the verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What are we reading? We're reading about Calvary. We're reading about the shed blood. We're reading about the fact that the Son of God left heaven's glory came into this world, took the form of a man, the God-man, lived a perfectly righteous life and died an atoning death. We read in that one line, Christ died for the ungodly. We read of the scourging of his back. We read of the mocking that he endured. We read of the crown of thorns upon his brow. We read of how they beat him and spat upon him. We're reading of how they put a cross on his back and made him drag it to he could carry it no longer in that portion that one line Christ died for the ungodly we read of the nails in his hands and in his feet we read how he hung and he bled and he died we read that he was preparing a way of freedom for those that are the slaves of sin if the son therefore shall make you free ye shall be free indeed. Friend, don't think for a moment that you can free yourself from your sin. Don't think for a moment that you can liberate yourself from the bondage of your sin. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 makes it perfectly clear. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't liberate yourself. You can't free yourself from your sin. You need the liberty that is found in Jesus Christ. And look at John 8 in the verse 36. Isn't there a wonderful assurance here? There's a word that's repeated twice that I think is a word well worth circling, underlining, or remembering. It says, if the Son therefore, look at it, Shall. Not a lovely word. It's a promise, you know. If the Son therefore shall make you free, it says, look at it, ye, we see it again the second time, ye shall, ye shall be free indeed. Why? Why can that verse, why can the Lord speak so emphatically that there is liberty in him? Why can he say that? Because he knew and it proved to be true that the cross would be a success, that the cross would be a success, that his blood would be shed. He was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, remember. He knew the cross would be a success. It was a success. The resurrection was the proof of that evidence. It was the proof of the fact that, that all the demands of the law were met. Everything was accomplished that, that had to be accomplished. Everything was done that had to be done. It was successful. As there's liberty in the Savior and liberty in the Savior for us. But then last of all, I want you to note not only the bondage of sin, the person of the Son, the liberty in the Savior, but number four, the assurance of salvation. The assurance of salvation. You see, there's a lovely phrase at the end of this verse. A lovely phrase, a wonderful phrase. Look what it says, verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. 
Isn't that lovely? Oh, that's a line worth remembering, friend. Ye shall be free indeed. What is that? That's a promise. That's an assurance. That's a promise from Almighty God that you can take with you in that sense all the way to the bank, for you know it's true. Ye shall be free indeed. Anyone that is saved, anyone that has repented and believed the gospel, anyone that has become a new creature in Christ, you can know tonight. You can know that you're saved. You know that? You can know that you're saved. You don't have to be doubting that you're saved. You don't have to wonder whether you're saved. Come over a few pages to John 17 and the verse 3. You can know that you're saved. I think that's what's so sad about all the false religions in this world. Even speaking to those Russellites last week, uh, they, they hoped they were right with God. Speak to the Roman Catholic. They hope that they're right with God. You speak to the Mormon, they hope that they're right with God. You speak to the Muslim, they hope that they're right with God. Listen, Christian, you can know that you're right with God. You can have that 110% assurance. I know that I'm right with God. I know that heaven is my home. I know I've been liberated from sin, death, and hell. And it says in John 17 and the verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You can know that you're right. You can know that you're saved. You can have that full assurance of salvation. Come with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, just a page over from our verse. John chapter 10, look at the verses 28 and 29. The Lord speaks here and the Lord speaks so emphatically and it's wonderful and it's comfort to the soul. And maybe, maybe there's even a child of God in the meeting tonight and at times you lie awake at night and you, you're staring blindly at the ceiling all night long and you say, I wonder if I'm saved. I wonder if I'm right with God. I wonder if heaven will be mine. And maybe you're just, you're just craving that assurance of salvation and you just can't get it yet. Well, the Lord gave a word to you friend and it says in John 10 look at the verse 28 and I give unto them eternal life look at it and they shall never perish neither shall any pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand the Lord has given you a promise when you know God when you've repented when you believe the gospel you can know that you're liberated from your bondage of sin you can know you're right with God you can know heaven is your home you can know that you shall never perish isn't that incredible you can know those things you can know so maybe you're here tonight and you say well how do I obtain such a promise? How do I obtain such a promise as that? How, how do I know, really know, that I'm free from my sin? How do I know that I'm free from the hell that I deserve? How do I know? Well, you follow the command of the Lord in his very first sermon. Mark 1 and the verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's it, friend. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You do those two things, you can know. You can know you're liberated. You can know you have freedom in Jesus Christ. You can know. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And then you can apply the words of John 8, verse 36 to your soul. And you can say, repeating the Lord's words, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And you can say, and I look back to March 1999 as a child, and I can say it was in March 1999 that the Son made me free. And hallelujah in Christ, I shall be free indeed. Free indeed. The bondage of sin no longer touches me. Hell will never, never touch me. Heaven to be forever with the Lord. I, I ask, will you be saved? Will you be saved? Do you realize how serious your sin is? 
Do you realize how serious it is to be a slave of sin, to be in bondage with a yoke of sin? Will you be saved? Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ, as God became God manifest in the flesh, to live a righteous life, to die an atoning death, to die for his people. And if you repent, if you believe, you can know, you can have full assurance that you're free, and hallelujah, you're free indeed. I trust each and every one of us, by the time we leave this meeting, will say hallelujah. Yes, tonight, I know I'm free. The Son has made me free. I'm free indeed. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall, ye shall be free indeed. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own namesake. Hymn number 236. 236, out of Christ, without a Savior. Oh, can it, can it be like a ship without a rudder on a wild and stormy sea? Oh, to be out without a Savior, with no hope nor refuge nigh, can it be, O oh, blessed Savior, one without thee dares to die. Hymn number 236 will stand as we sing. Let's stand together. <coughs>
Heavenly Father, we do pray that there would be no one in our midst tonight that would dare die in their sin without Christ. O oh God, we pray that they would seek the Lord while he may be found, that they would call upon him while he is near. Save souls, we plead. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.